Since her appearance in the 2012 Oscar-nominated documentary The Invisible War, our next performer has spoken all over the country about her experience in the military. In addition to earning her Ph.D. in public health, she advocates daily for the health care of veterans and active duty service members and is passionate about healing with humor, which she can do very well because she's been twice voted San Diego's funniest comic. Welcome, my friend, Allison Gill. I ran out of college money the college money my dad had willed me after only four semesters. So in 1994, at the age of 20, I dropped out and moved to Los Angeles to be a musician and an actress. Thank you. I'd grown up on stage playing piano and guitar, singing, acting, dancing, so I thought I'd have a go at it for serious, since I couldn't finish school. In hindsight, I was killing it, you guys. I was acting in big films, playing in bars and coffee houses, hanging out at the Emmys, but I was too young and naive and impatient to recognize my success. So I felt like a failure, and I ended up joining the Navy, which had been romanticized in my family. My parents fell in love when my dad was in the military, so I thought I'd travel the world and find a man, or at least finish college and find a man. I was one of the first women accepted into the nuclear program. I went to boot camp with 84 other females, but when I got to nuke school, the balance shifted. There were four of us and 600 men. That's 150 dudes for every woman. I was literally and figuratively isolated from the start. My living quarters were on the opposite side of base in the old staff housing because the barracks didn't have female facilities. All the men had to take sensitivity training because of me. They even sent a dentist to give me my pap smear because there was no GYN on base. So when I was actually invited to a, a barracks party, I jumped at the chance. Having just finished boot camp, my wardrobe was limited to the standard issue dungarees, a super sexy and now obsolete uniform consisting of a long sleeve button up denim shirt and high waisted bell bottom jeans. Thank you. I walked into a room full of men playing spades and dominoes and drinking games, and I made my way around the party until I found a group to settle in with. This was a group of people, incidentally, who had promised to literally take a bullet for me, so I didn't even think twice about the fact that I was the only woman in the room. This was my family. These were my brothers, my shipmates. I ended up talking to a cute guy, and I was having such a good time, I didn't notice the hour until we were the only two people left in the room. I would love to tell you what happened next, but I don't know. What I do remember is stumbling into the police station at four in the morning, wearing only a blanket and bleeding. I told the master at arms that I thought I'd been raped. And he led me to a cold room with a slick waxed floor and sat me down on one side of a metal desk under a single industrial pendant lamp. I was too young to know how cliche a scene that was. I sat there, terrified, 19, fresh out of boot camp, compliant, obedient, broken down, and without a sense of self. A blank slate with no esteem. And that's when the interrogation began. Why had I been at that party? What was I wearing? <laughs> what was I drinking? Why was I drinking? Was I flirting? Did I have a boyfriend? Were we fighting? What happened in the police station that night was the real trauma, because I can recall every second of it. A second man then came in and briefed me on the consequences of filing a false rape report. He said I could be court-martialed, that I would lose the most prestigious school in the Navy, I would lose my rank and my rate. He said I would lose all my benefits, including my GI Bill, my $60,000 signing bonus, and I'd probably be dishonorably discharged. He even told me I would be charged with adultery because my rapist was married. 
and I'll never forget his parting words as he ushered me out of the police station wearing only a blanket. Why don't we chalk this up to what it really is? A series of bad decisions on your part. I was terrified. They'd convinced me it was my fault. I was ashamed, and I definitely didn't file a report. I fully believed it was a series of bad decisions on my part. That self-blame was so deep in me that years later, I would repeat the bullshit they fed me to my best friend after she had been raped. You shouldn't have flirted with them. You're smarter than that. You shouldn't have put yourself in that situation. Their words coming out of my mouth. And it is the biggest regret of my life. After the assault, I reached into my limited bag of coping tools, and the first thing that I found was booze. My relationship with liquor went from light and fun to utilitarian and medicinal before I was even old enough to legally drink. Drinking was the best way for me to keep up the charade of self-blame and ignore the truth. I found myself drinking with my classmates during any free time we had. We would drink every night after mandatory study hours, and we would drink so much I could barely keep it down during the mandatory two-mile run every morning at 0430. But so many other people were puking during the run that it seemed completely normal. I learned a lot about booze over the decade I used it as a survival tool, specifically that it's a super temporary solution that does more harm than good. I see, brains are amazing things in that they never stop working on your behalf, but you can only keep them quiet for so long. So when alcohol was no longer doing the job, I launched the More Sex Initiative. <laughs> Using sex to cope employs the same mechanisms as an eating disorder. It's about regaining control over your body. So having all sorts of sex at my own discretion and on my own terms was how I achieved that. It was a preemptive strike, shock and awe, like my brain was initiating sex with people before they could rape us. I even traded sexual favors for the test questions ahead of time with one of the teachers. Boy, I sure showed him. Ironically, he was my heat transfer and fluid flow instructor. <laughs> but sex eventually became a chore, killing any kind of meaningful relationship during the subsequent 15 years. The loneliness compounded with the trauma worsened my depression, and it compounded the need for different adaptation strategies. That's when I began overachieving. And it's the only coping mechanism that I've never quit using. After the rape, I dove into my schoolwork. I studied until midnight every night of the week, and I raised my grades from a 2.8 to a 4.0. I graduated nuke school with a perfect score, despite drinking, depression, and crippling anxiety, armed with only booze, a stack of books, and the heat transfer and fluid flow test questions. <laughs> it would turn out, though, that even overachieving can backfire. Because when I filed my claim for PTSD with the Department of Veterans Affairs, it was denied three times over five years. And not only because I had no proof, the VA said I couldn't have been raped because my grades got better. They reasoned that no one's grades get better after a traumatic event. After many years of failed attempts to cope using booze, sex, and achievements, I turned to yoga which I won't talk about too much because people want to hear about yoga like they want to hear about CrossFit and being vegan. <laughs> but I'll say this, the word yoga is from the Sanskrit to join or to yoke. And knowing that traumatic events drive a wedge between the mind and the body, mitigating that duality with yoga is a very powerful way to heal yourself. I remember my first yoga classes feeling very uncomfortable during hip openers and heart openers and other vulnerable positions. I would break down sobbing sometimes because I was processing events instead of ignoring them, which led me to believe that yoga is the best non-medicinal treatment for PTS, and I'm still trying to get the VA to pay for it instead of the mountains of antipsychotics, SSRIs, MAOIs, benzodiazepines, and antidepressants, often pushed with pain medications that could render me flatly affected, comatose, or even dead. I'll take yoga, thanks. 
Many years later, I would stumble upon my favorite coping mechanism, or rediscover it, rather, and almost completely by accident. See, I was a musician by trade before joining the Navy, a serious musician, a classically trained coffeehouse feminist, angry Lilith Fair minor chord musician. But one fateful night in 2004, I went to a Flaming Lips concert, and Liz Fair was opening. And if you know those bands, you know that's a weird combo. And when Liz Fair was on stage, most of the Flaming Lips fans were ignoring her, milling around, getting drinks, until she started singing a song called Hot White Come. The whole place stopped and turned to look at the stage like a needle had come off a record. You could see their furrowed brows and confused looks asking, is she singing about come? And then the chorus came again, and yes, she was singing about come. And I realized what I had to do. I had to write songs about come. <laughs> I had to because that's what people were paying attention to. I started an imaginary band called the Crooked Bush. Our first album was called Giraffe Deep Throat. So many of my songs were about rape, and I didn't even know it. As a musician and a comic, I wasn't aware of why I wrote what I wrote until much later, if ever. And I recommend you creative types go back and revisit your old work. There's clues in there about who you are that you may have never realized. I don't play the songs anymore for several reasons. First of all, I've moved on. Comedy evolves. They serve their purpose. But most importantly, if ingested without irony, they definitely perpetuate the rape culture. I'll give you a small example. I went to the bar to meet my young man. He ordered me up a tall black and tan. Then after that one came two, three, and four. As I finished them off, he continued to pour. When I asked him why he kept filling my cup, he said, I'm doing my best to get you liquored up. When I asked him why, he said, here's what he thunk. Girls are more fun to fuck when they're drunk. We're more fun to fuck when we're drunk. We're more fun to fuck when we're drunk. Just give us some liquor and you'll bet us quicker Just give us some booze and we'll spread the good news Just give us some jack, we work best on our backs We're more fun to fuck Tell your brother, good luck We're more fun to fuck when we're drunk Hilarious I was writing songs about rape that I could laugh at years before I realized I had ever even been raped. Maybe I was prepping myself for the big reveal with humor. So even though these songs are retired, my jokes are still largely about sex and drinking and rape because that's how comedy works. We take our trauma and we spin it into gold to make you laugh. We're like twisted alchemists. We laugh at our own sadness to vanquish it, getting it out of our heads and into the world, then repeating it over and over kind of like exposure therapy. Laughter kept me alive during the years before I even knew what I was up against. And making other people laugh with reworked trauma is cathartic. In fact, a guy I was dating one time asked me if I wanted to try rape fantasies. I was like, no. And he goes, that's the spirit. Thank you. <laughs> 